Usually only victories and success are glorified and celebrated, while retreats are associated with defeat and shame. Yet there have been countless times when retreats have saved an entire army from destruction, keeping the cause they were fighting for alive, and enabling them to escape and fight another day. While a single battle might be lost upon retreat, the war can still be won, while some daring escapes against the odds can even become victories on their own, inspiring others to never give up, no matter how bad the odds. Here are my choices for five of the most incredible and daring retreats that saved the day. Number 5. The March of the Ten Thousand What began as just another job for a band of battle-hardened ancient Greek mercenaries quickly descended into a desperate fight for survival as 10,000 men found themselves trapped deep behind enemy lines where they were forced to battle their way mile by mile through hostile terrain in an incredible journey home to safety that has gone down as one of the greatest adventures in human history. At this time in history, Greece was awash with out-of-work veterans of the Peloponnesian Wars, which had left the country in ruins. For many ex-soldiers, work as a mercenary must have seemed to be the only way to escape poverty, and the men found no shortage of potential employers in the vast expanse of Asia. The hoplite heavy infantry so favoured by the Greeks, earning a well-deserved fearsome reputation amongst their neighbours for their prowess in battle, the elite units becoming highly prized by warlords and kings across the ancient world, eager to obtain their services in exchange for coin. It was against this backdrop that the Persian prince Cyrus hired a band of 10,000 mercenary Greek hoplites on the premise that they would be used to put down a small rebellion of tribesmen deep within the Persian Empire. However, after accepting the contract, the Greeks soon realised that the prince intended to use their spears for a much riskier operation. The Persian king had recently died and been succeeded by Cyrus's brother, a fact which troubled the ambitious young man and desiring the throne for himself. Cyrus put together a plan to seize it by force, having already raised his own army of Persians, hiring the legendary Greek hoplites to give him the edge he needed to win the coming civil war. In 401 BC, the Greek mercenaries and Cyrus' army arrived near modern-day Baghdad to engage in battle with the king's forces to decide who would rule the Persian Empire once and for all. The 10,000 Greeks quickly proved that their reputation was well deserved, easily scattering their opposition and reportedly only losing one man. Yet although a tactical victory had been won, Prince Cyrus had engaged in a brave but dangerous charge, rushing forward on horseback in an attempt to kill his brother and end the battle. However, before reaching his target, he was hit in the eye with a javelin and hacked to pieces by enemy soldiers. With Cyrus dead, the war was over, and the 10,000 mercenaries now found themselves stranded deep within the Persian Empire, lacking food, supplies, and friends, surrounded on all sides by hostile populations who wanted nothing more than to see the foreign invaders destroyed. Yet the Persian generals seemed to be reluctant to attack the vulnerable Greeks head-on, as they had already shown their potent abilities in battle, and so he instead allowed the 10,000 men to wander, confident that despair and lack of food would finish the men off for him. However, the highly disciplined men were in no mood to give up, and after gathering up what little food they could beg, buy or steal, they began an epic march through hundreds of miles of enemy territory, harassed by enemy forces and hostile natives every step of the way. As the 10,000 men made their way through Persia, a local governor hatched a plan that he hoped would crush the troublesome band of Greeks and earn favour with his king. Knowing that attacking the heavy troops head-on was highly risky, he invited the mercenary leaders to a feast as a gesture of goodwill, promising the men safe passage through his territory if they would just leave without causing trouble. However, the invitation was a trap, and the mercenary generals and captains were betrayed, the men taken captive as they arrived at the feast before being beheaded. With the 10,000 now left stranded with their entire leadership destroyed, it was hoped that they would turn on each other, enabling the divided and chaotic survivors to be picked off one by one. However, once again the Greeks' response was unexpected. Rather than giving in to despair, the men were angered by the betrayal and promptly elected new leaders who encouraged the men to continue fighting their way out of Persia. Their perilous march continued, and the men battled through barren deserts, snow-filled mountain passes, and desolate plains, all the while continually harassed by hostile soldiers and tribes, suffering with exhaustion, dehydration, and starvation. The epic march continued for over nine months, until they finally sighted the Black Sea, the haggard survivors roaring with joy at the sight of the water which would carry them home. 
When the march had begun, the Greeks stood 10,400 strong. However, by the end of their ordeal, only 6,000 remained among the living, finally making it home to Greece, where their remarkable tale resounded amongst their fellow countrymen. The incredible feat of survival against all the odds, planting the idea in the minds of many Greeks that a large Persian force could be defeated by a small band of disciplined Greek hoplites, perhaps even inspiring the later invasion of the Persian Empire, planned by Philip of Macedon and carried out by his son, the legendary Alexander the Great. Number 4. The Battle of Long Island In August 1776, little more than eight weeks after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, General George Washington and 9,000 troops of the Continental Army found themselves trapped on Long Island with the East River to their backs. Their position surrounded by a superior British force, which had just soundly defeated them at the Battle of Long Island. With the waters around the island patrolled by the mighty Royal Navy, and with thousands of well-supplied and highly disciplined British troops tightening the noose around them, it seemed as if the American Revolution was over before it had even begun. After earlier defeating the British in the Siege of Boston in March, General Washington marched his army to New York in the heart of the Thirteen Colonies, realising that the city's port would provide an ideal base for the Royal Navy during the long war that was to follow. Hoping to prevent this strategically important location falling into enemy hands, he established strong defences in the area, which he hoped would repel the expected British attack. However, when the attack finally came at the Battle of Long Island, Washington's army was outflanked and beaten. The panicked men of the Continental Army forced to fall back to fortifications they had prepared on Brooklyn Heights. The battle had been a complete disaster for Washington. He had lost around 20% of his troops. However, a heroic rearguard action by a group of men known as the Maryland 400 had prevented even more of his army from being destroyed. The small group of Marylanders were virtually wiped out while bravely holding off the British onslaught, buying just enough time for the majority of Washington's forces to safely retreat back to the strongly fortified Brooklyn Heights where they could regroup. While this heroic action had saved the rest of the army, Washington now found himself trapped on the Brooklyn Heights, his army of 9,000 largely untrained volunteers, fenced in by 20,000 experienced British troops with the East River to their backs. The American cause seemed doomed, however the British General Howe made the fateful decision to lay siege to the trapped Washington instead of immediately attacking and finishing off the demoralised Continental Army, believing that a siege would win the day while losing as few of his men as possible. As night fell, the trapped American soldiers waited for the attack that would end them. However, General Washington had other ideas. Realising that his only choice was to somehow get his men off the island, he had ordered his men to gather up as many boats as they could lay their hands on, and to have them in the East River by sunset. To outsiders it might seem as though he planned to use the boats to bring in reinforcements, however he instead planned an audacious nighttime evacuation of every last soldier under his command. Fortunately for Washington, the weather was on his side, a bad storm had prevented the British fleet from sailing up the East River, while the heavy rain, coupled with the darkness, provided the perfect cover for the gathering of boats. Unit by unit, the American forces were transported across the river to Manhattan and Freedom, each man ordered to move in silence, the oars used to row the boats, muffled with cloth so as not to alert the besieging British, while campfires were left burning to give the impression that the men were still at their posts. Thousands made it across the river that night, yet it was still not enough, and thousands more men remained stranded on Long Island at daybreak. However, once again the weather intervened on the side of General Washington. A thick fog settled over his position, enabling him to continue the evacuation in daylight while remaining concealed from the British. By the time British patrols noticed that the American pickets were missing, it was too late. All 9,000 troops had made it across the river with no loss of life and with most of their equipment and artillery intact. The siege had been broken and Washington and his army had escaped certain destruction. Despite the battle being a technical British victory and New York falling into enemy hands, Washington and his army had escaped to fight another day, keeping the revolutionary cause alive. The band of volunteers had shown that they could stand together against a larger and better trained foe and live to tell the tale, while the British had been robbed of an opportunity to crush the rebellion quickly and cheaply, realising that the fight against the rebels would be longer and tougher than they had ever expected. Number 3. The Long March 
In 1934, the Chinese communists found themselves surrounded by 700,000 well-organized and supplied nationalist government troops who were intent on their destruction. Hemmed in on all sides by hostile forces and a series of castle-like cement fortifications, their dream of establishing a Soviet-style communist state in China seemed to be turning to ashes in front of their eyes as the government troops slowly closed in, inflicting massive casualties on the already decimated Red Army. Yet, inspired by Mao Zedong, the besieged band of revolutionaries would turn defeat into victory, embarking on a dangerous breakout and retreat that was truly epic in scale. The long march they undertook achieving near mythological status and sealing Mao's position in power, paving the way for the eventual total victory of the communists, despite just 10% of his original army surviving the harrowing journey. The devastating Chinese Civil War had begun in 1927 as communists fought the nationalist-led government of the Republic of China for control of the country. However, by the early 1930s, the situation was looking bleak for the communists. Between 1930 and 1934, the nationalists had launched four massive attacks against the Red Army's base of operations, which the communists had barely survived thanks to effective guerrilla warfare tactics developed by Mao. However, the fifth attack was a giant encirclement consisting of 700,000 government troops, the bold move trapping the communists and leaving them with just two grim choices. Fight to the last man and be destroyed, or abandon their base and attempt a risky breakout and escape. In October 1934, the communist leadership decided that their best chance at avoiding complete annihilation was to attempt a breakout and lengthy retreat to the relative safety of the North, where they could link up with other communist units and continue the fight, and so the surviving 86,000 troops launched an all-out attack on the weaker section of the nationalist lines, managing to break through and flee west, while wounded or ill soldiers stayed behind to fight a delaying action. Although the breakout was successful, the losses had been horrendous, and several prominent members of the party had been captured and executed, including Mao's own brother. Yet, the ordeal the survivors would have to endure was only just beginning, and what followed was an incredible 370-day march to safety, spanning at least 4,000 miles across some of China's harshest terrain, the battered and weary band of soldiers crossing 18 mountain ranges and 24 rivers as they desperately tried to reach a safe haven in the far northwest of the country. At every step of the way, they were pursued and attacked by nationalist troops and hostile local warlords, suffering through lethal bombardments from the Air Force, all while combating starvation, disease, and extreme weather conditions. By the time Mao arrived at his destination in October 1935, a mere 8,000 troops remained from the original 86,000 who had participated in the breakout and retreat. Yet the Red Army had survived to fight another day, earning support from large numbers of Chinese people along the way and establishing a largely positive reputation. The heroism of the soldiers who took part in the Long March inspired thousands to join the Communist Party. The legendary story of escape and refusal to give up in the face of adversity, elevating Mao to the heights of power and influence, enabling him to become the undisputed leader of the Chinese Communist Party and providing his forces the breathing space they needed to rebuild and regroup, eventually taking the fight back to the enemy, defeating them and driving them out of mainland China to the island of Taiwan, an area still disputed to this day. Number 2. The Evacuation at Gallipoli the Allied landings at Gallipoli had been intended to capture the Ottoman capital and open up access to the Black Sea, dealing a major blow to the Central Powers while relieving pressure on the Russians. However, the campaign quickly descended into a murderous war of attrition, where the blood of a quarter of a million men was spent for little gain, as hundreds of thousands of soldiers were repeatedly sent into the meat grinder that was First World War trench warfare. The campaign had been a failure, yet over 100,000 soldiers still remained trapped on the tiny beachheads they had captured, unable to press forward against a well-defended enemy who held the high ground, but unable to retreat without risking the loss of the entire army. The Dardanelles is a strait that splits Europe and Asia while connecting the Black Sea to the Mediterranean, making it a prized target that Britain and France were keen to secure, thus opening a sea route to their Russian allies. In 1915, they launched an invasion which was intended to capture the coastline around the strait along with the Ottoman capital. However, after eight months of brutal fighting, the Allies had suffered a staggering quarter of a million casualties in exchange for little more than a few small beachheads. 
the Allies' plan had quickly fallen apart due to a deadly mixture of poor leadership, flawed tactics, and a complete lack of surprise. Planners had failed to anticipate the fierce opposition provided by Turkish troops, while at the same time sending insufficient equipment, along with far fewer soldiers than such a grand operation required, many of whom lacked the experience necessary to make such a complex operation successful. The men landing on the beaches had inaccurate maps and intelligence, while the Turkish enemies were intimately familiar with the area, digging in on the high ground overlooking the beaches, from which they could rain down death and destruction on the invaders. Facing such odds, the Allied forces were barely able to penetrate more than a few hundred yards from the sea, confined to the narrow beachheads they had established. Rather than becoming a lightning-fast dash for the capital, the campaign descended into the hell of trench warfare, and the body count quickly began to rise. As 1915 came to a close, it was clear that without huge numbers of reinforcements, victory was out of reach, and so the decision was made to withdraw. However, there were still as many as 100,000 men on the beaches, Yet such a large-scale evacuation was fraught with danger due to the close proximity of Ottoman forces. When an army retreats, it's especially vulnerable, as the enemy is unlikely to allow you to simply leave unhampered, and will instead use this golden opportunity to attack you while your defences are down, causing immense chaos and inflicting huge casualties in the process. Massive losses were anticipated by commanders, with some estimating that up to 50% of the men might be lost, during the evacuation. It was clear that in order to avert disaster and massive loss of life, the men would somehow need to leave the peninsula without alerting the ever-watchful Turks, and so an elaborate series of deceptions were used to try and mask the evacuation while giving the Turks the impression that the Allied trenches were still manned, thus preventing an attack while the men were at their most vulnerable. Fires were left burning, Dummies dressed in uniforms were dotted throughout the trenches, and empty equipment boxes were left on the beach to convince the enemy that nothing had been removed. In the weeks leading up to the evacuation, silent stunts had been performed, where no artillery fire or sniping took place. The curious Turks would move forward to investigate the seas in activity, only to be mowed down by machine gun fire thus making them extra cautious during periods of silence, and perhaps buying the Allies extra time when the real withdrawal came. Over two weeks the evacuation took place in waves, as men moved out under cover of darkness, their boots covered with sacks to muffle the sounds, until eventually only a small rearguard of about 2,000 men remained, all alone in the miles of now empty trenches. These last few souls were especially vulnerable, however they too were able to retreat, using the ingenious strip guns, which were rifles rigged to fire automatically while the men were retreating, giving the Turks the impression that the trenches were still occupied, despite now being completely deserted. Against all the odds, the evacuation had been a complete success, with all 100,000 men safely off the beaches, at the cost of just three casualties, far fewer than the 50% that had been predicted. The retreat's careful execution had saved tens of thousands of lives, and despite the invasion going down in history as one of the First World Wars, many great military blunders, the evacuation lives on as an example of how planning and deception can save the day. Number 1. Dunkirk In May 1940, the entire British expeditionary force in France, along with vast numbers of Belgian and French soldiers, found themselves trapped in a tiny pocket along the northern coast of France, the cold waters of the English Channel to their back, while German forces rapidly closed in on all sides. The fate of the world hung in the balance, as a total of 400,000 Allied soldiers faced annihilation or capture, the effect of such a loss possibly ending the Second World War, five years ahead of schedule, with a dramatic Axis victory. The only chance of escape lay in a last-ditch mass evacuation from the beach town of Dunkirk, back to England and safety. Yet such a large-scale movement of men seemed beyond possibility, and with German forces drawing ever closer, it was estimated that a mere 45,000 might be saved. The Allies prepared for disaster, and the loss of upwards of 350,000 fighting men. When Germany invaded Poland in 1939, Britain dispatched an expeditionary force to France to aid in her Allies' defence, sure that a German attack was imminent. However, the Allied forces were caught off guard by an audacious German attack through Belgium and the Netherlands, bypassing the heavily fortified Maginot Line on the French border with Germany. 
The incredible speed and aggression of the Blitzkrieg tactics deployed by the Germans quickly pushed the Allies back towards the sea until they found themselves trapped in an ever-shrinking pocket around the coastal town of Dunkirk. As many as 400,000 men, along with vast amounts of vehicles, tanks, and supplies, were now just days away from being destroyed or falling into enemy hands, as the Germans stood on the cusp of one of the greatest military victories in the history of war. For the Allies, disaster was now unavoidable. The only question was how bad would it be? A hasty evacuation plan was drawn up in a last-ditch effort to salvage as many men as they could. However, with so little time available, and with so many men needing to be saved, expectations were low, and it was widely believed that perhaps just 45,000 might be saved before the Germans overran the town. A desperate call went out for as many boats as the Navy could lay their hands on, as an armada consisting of everything from Royal Navy warships to civilian pleasure craft was assembled on the other side of the channel, ready to sail across the water to save as many men as was possible. Operation Dynamo had begun. In the Allied pocket around Dunkirk, British and French units fought desperate rearguard actions, often fighting to the last man in an attempt to delay the German onslaught and buy the rest of the army more time to escape. Yet the Allies were also aided by Hitler himself, who made the unusual decision to halt the advance of his panzer tanks, which were ready to deal the finishing blow. Why he did this is still debated, with some arguing that he thought the German air force could finish the job, thus sparing his precious ground forces, while others say that he thought Britain might be more willing to accept peace without the humiliation of seeing her entire army surrender. Regardless of the reasons for the attack's halt, this fortunate turn of events brought the Allies more time to fortify Dunkirk and withdraw even more men than was ever hoped for, and by the time the German ground attack recommenced, the largest sea evacuation in history had begun, as thousands of men waded into the cold sea to board the vessels which had braved the heavily mined waters around Dunkirk, all the while under vicious bombardment from the Luftwaffe, which bombed and strafed the retreating men without mercy. The operation might still have completely failed were it not for the 3,500 sorties flown by the Royal Air Force as Spitfires fought lethal duels in the skies above the beach, going to great efforts to protect the snaking queues of vulnerable men on the sand below as they waited for their turn to board the boats and escape home to safety. Thanks to the efforts of all those involved, Something close to a miracle had been achieved, as over 300,000 Allied soldiers were successfully brought back across the English Channel by June 4th, 1940. Yet the incredible feat had come at a great cost, with over 200 ships lost and over 100,000 men left behind or killed in the defence. France would soon fall, and the war would drag on for five more long and bloody years. However, the great number of soldiers rescued would live to fight another day, the miracle of Dunkirk surviving as an enduring example of how victory can be snatched from the jaws of defeat. So those are my choices for five incredible and daring retreats that saved the day. Let me know your thoughts and which other escapes you would have included in the list in the comments below, and I'll see you again soon.